he was transfigured before them. They got to the top of the hill and Yeshua, the Savior, changed in front of them. His face shone like the sun. The Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 27, we have several subjects. We have the subject of Peter, James, and John on Mount Tabor, or more familiar, Mount, Mount Tabor. In Hebrew, it is Tabor, not Tabor. Uh, the reason for the difference between a V and a B, Tabor, is doesn't you know you doesn't flow off your t tongue, Mount Tabor, it just slips off your tongue, and that's how you change a B and a V. A B and a V in Hebrew are the same letter, but it comes out of your mouth a little different. <coughs> Before we got to Mount Tabor, in Matthew chapter 16, in the last time we studied from Matthew, when Yeshua came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi, a place called Banias, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Caesarea, not Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi in the very north of the country, at the bottom of Mount Hermon, there is water that actually comes out of the mountain itself. A spring, the snows go down into the mountain, and at Banias, the water comes out of the mountain, like an underground stream coming out. And that's where... Yeshua and his disciples were when he asked them the question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? If you've not been to Banias, it is like a jungle area. Lots of trees, lots of, lots of vegetation, and the stream. This stream is fi filtered in by other streams besides the underground stream that comes out of Mount Hermon. And the setting is beautiful. And about a kilometer down from where it's come out of the mountain, mountain there is a waterfall and another beautiful place. Yes. Uh, uh, a place that people in Israel like to go and swim. How far is Banias to Mount Tavor? You see Caesarea Philippi in the very north, almost to the border of Lebanon, and to, to your right would be Syria, and they would travel from there down past the swamplands. See that little lake in the middle? That's not really a lake, it's more of a swamp. And they've killed off all of the mosquitoes that used to plague people with malaria. But the swamp is still there. It's a low-lying area between a couple of sets of mountains. In that valley where that little lake is, that's the area of Israel when they, they plant their main crop in that area is alfalfa. And in that valley, watered by the swampland underneath and by sprinkler systems and by the humidity, humidity. If you're there in the summer, you're always going like this. It is humid in that Hula Valley. In a bad year, they get 18 cuttings of alfalfa. That's a, a bad year. In a good year, they get 24 cuttings 
of a alfalfa. And they, then they still have three months where there's no crops. So I was amazed at that. We grow, grew alfalfa on part of our farm and our neighbors grew it. And if on Vancouver Island, if we got two cuttings, we thought we were doing good. Yeah. And if we got three cuttings, we thought we were in heaven. <laughs> and so that is a very productive valley. The, the elevations that you go through from Banias at the foot of Mount Hermon down into that valley, which is actually below sea level. And then from there you continue downhill to the Sea of Galilee, which is now about 1,500 meters below sea level. And then you climb back up out of the Sea of Galilee and you go up to the a plateau the, in the region of the Galilee. You climb to a plateau. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, we read, Six days later, we were at Banias, Caesarea Philippi, and then six days later, Yeshua took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And this mountain is not an easy mountain to climb up. It's not an easy mountain to drive up. And this year, there was much rain in Israel. And when it rains in Israel, it, at this time of the year, middle of February, beginning in March, the hillsides just came alive. And this is a picture from one week ago in Israel at Mount Tabor. It is a garden of Eden when the rains come. You imagine trying to irrigate that as your garden? God has his own irrigation system. And what a beautiful sight it is to see these wild flowers just carpeting the hillside. This is the summer last year. The grasses are green. That was probab that's probably one of the alfalfa fields. And Mount T Tabor rises about 350 meters above the valley. And if you go there, usually the the tours don't take you up to Mount Tabor. They don't allow tour buses to go up the little snake road. And this uh, Arab Israeli community, they have taxis. And the the road up is around the backside, near where the other picture was taken. And it's snakes back and forth. And if you have a, an oncoming vehicle, both of the vehicles stop and they sneak by each other. And it, it is, uh, and those Arab drivers, uh, Palestinian Arab drivers, many of them believing. There's uh, two communities there. One's a Christian community and one's a Muslim community. And they, inside of Israel, get along well. And they have a great business driving their taxis like race cars up this death mountain. <laughs> Can you, continuing in the scriptures. Jesus and his disciples didn't take the taxi up. They probably didn't take the donkey up. Uh, last week, or a week ago, I was reading a sign on Mayor McGrath. Did you, and it says, did you know more people are killed riding a donkey than are killed on airplanes every year in the world? 
So don't ride the donkeys. Take an airplane to the top. <laughs> so they walked up there. And it's a good walk. Steep hills. And he was transfigured before them. They got to the top of the hill. And Yeshua, the Savior, changed in front of them. His face shone like the sun. And his clothing changed from a linen yellowing color to dazzling white. And I can picture Peter, James, and John standing, seeing Jesus stand, standing there and all of a sudden the, the glow of heaven transforms him. And the beauty of his face is glorious. And then his clothes become dazzling white because in him there is no sin. There's not even a shadow of a turn of darkness in him. And then suddenly appearing with Jesus are Moses and Elijah. Why? Lots of theories. But they were there to encourage their Savior and their Master. They were there to look on the face of the one who was soon to be crucified. They were there, I believe, to encourage him. Stay, stick in there. It's going to be worth it all. And Peter said, let's, it's good that we're here. Man, this is wonderful. We've got to see Moses and Elijah, the two great prophets of the faith. Elijah, he was to come back. And Moses had died. I want you to know this. Moses had died and God had buried him. Elijah was carried into heaven in a fiery chariot. So there's one that went, went to heaven alive and there's one that went to heaven dead. And he's alive again. I want you to know that being absent from our bodies are to be present with the Lord. When we, when we step out of this suitcase that we're wearing, we're in God's presence and we are alive. I have good news for you. We will never die. I will never die. You will never die. You need to tell yourself, I will never die. Jesus said to us, I give unto you everlasting life. And you will never die. We lay down this old suitcase. When they put, bury this suitcase under six feet of dirt, I'm not there. Amen. Amen. The guy who talks, the guy who thinks, the guy who sometimes gets angry, the guy who gets happy and joyous and jumps up and down and shouts, he is not under six feet of dirt. The angels have come and carried this Sydney into the heavens. This Son of God into the places of eternity. To be with Him, our Savior, forever and ever. Peter says, wow, this is great. We need to do something. We need to do something human 
in the midst of this glory that we're seeing. Anyone ever want to do that? And any of us like Peter? Peter said to Jesus, Look, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings for you. Peter said, I'm going to build three dwellings up on this top of this hill for you. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And we're going to stay here, and we're going to worship God inside of the buildings, and we're going to have a glorious heavenly experience. And Jesus said, that's not necessary. But later, the same kind of desire that Peter had to build a place to honor the Messiah and the prophet Moses and the miracle-working prophet Elijah, they did it. They built a place for all three of them. And today, instead of having a, a a flat top on that mountain where you can sit down under some trees. There are trees there. But you can go into a building and worship at a shrine. And while he was still speaking, while Peter was still speaking, a glory cloud came down on that mountain. Suddenly, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice came. And that voice announced, This is my Son, the Beloved. With Him, I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Picture yourself as John or Peter or James. God's glory descended on that mountain top. And the weight of that glory caused them to fall to the ground. And they were afraid. And God spoke and said, This is my son, my beloved. I am well pleased with him. And that's the construction of the, the Greek in that. With him, I am well pleased. What wasn't said? Hey guys, with you, I'm not so pleased. <laughs> and I can see the weight of God's glory the Holy Spirit convicting them. And in fear, they fell on the ground. I believe there was some repenting going on on that hilltop. The holiness of the living God was there. And the weight of His glory had come down. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit was there. In verse 9. Before verse 9. Jesus comes and says. Picks them up by the hand. And they get up. And Elijah. And Moses were gone. And it was just Jesus left. And they started on down the hill. There's a principle in this scripture that we need to learn. There are mountaintop experiences in our life. If you have never felt the weight of the glory of God around you and over you and in you, and you just are compelled to be on your knees or on your face, you need to seek it. And there's probably not one of you that is too young to in here that is too young to experience God's hand of glory on you. Amen. And if you want to experience that, you need to be seeking His face. You need to be beholding the glory of His face 
and the beauty of His face. And allowing Him to give you visions of who He is. 16 years old. After a youth meeting, I went in, into a prayer room by myself and I was just seeking God's face. It was probably not after 9 o'clock when I went into that prayer room. And something happened. The presence and the power of God was in that room. And after 12, that fast it seemed, someone came into the room and tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's time to go home. I don't, I was in God's presence. Whether I was in His presence in my body, I don't know that. But I know that I met the Master and was surrounded by His presence and was in His presence for three hours. And then I went home. And it was about a mile walk in the dark from that church building up McTavish Road to the farmhouse. And there was a section of that road I hated because both sides of the road were huge trees and it was dark. And even the, even the moon didn't seem to shine through that section. And I remember usually I would run through that section of the road about a quarter of a mile to get out of this darkness. But that night as I walked home, the glory of God was there and there was no fear. We need an encounter with the living God. Peter, James, and John that day, probably in the middle of the day, had an encounter with the living God. Not only the Son, but the Father and the Holy Spirit. And their lives were changed. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about this vision or this supernatural occurrence until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Their stomach probably stopped and jumped right then. Until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead, are you going to die? Would be my question. Peter probably asked that question and it was, but I can hear him saying, what do you mean after you're raised from the dead? So off the mountain and they go down into the valley. It is a proven fact. When you are close to God, and God is ministering to your heart and changing your life. And you have a glorious experience with the Savior. You're going to come down off that mountain. And you're going to have a sad awakening. Because you're going to be back into the real world. Their introduction to the real world as they descended those snake paths down from Mount Tabor was, don't tell anyone until after I rise from the dead. In verse 14 and verse 16, and they came to a crowd. The crowd, the people, had, those villages had seen Jesus and his disciples go up the hill. They're coming down, they're waiting. They came to a crowd and a man came and knelt before Yeshua. Knelt down in front of him. And he said, Lord, Adonai, have mercy on me. And on my son. For my son is an epileptic. And he suffers terribly. 
Sometimes he falls into the fire. And often he falls into the water. And I brought him to your disciples. And they could not cure him. We've just come down from the mountain where we've been in the presence of God. And everything should be possible. His disciples that were didn't go up the hill were down there and they were trying to heal this young boy. And they were not able to. And he comes to Jesus. And the question is, why can't we heal? Why can't we cast out demons? As the body of believers, as the family of God, that question is still real today. Why are we not healing the sick? Why are we not casting out demons? And Jesus said it's because of lack of faith. You're, you're back in the re, into the valley. You're back into the real world. In verse 20 it said, He said to them, Because of your little faith, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. And nothing would be impossible for you. We read some other scriptures in between there, and, and Jesus wasn't so kind to them. He was really, his tone and his words were disgusting at their lack of faith. And then he finishes by saying, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed. Mustard seed is just almost like the size of flour. It's small. It blows in the wind. It gets carried. But Jesus said, if we had the faith just of a mustard seed, then everything would be possible to us. The demons would come out. The, the sick would be healed. Cancer would be eradicated. Depression would be a thing of the past. The hospitals would be becoming empty. We need to grow our faith. We need Faith in our life. We need to know that is it comes, the miracles come through the living God. They do not depend on us. Canadians are a bunch of crybabies. Americans are the same. <laughs> Sometimes because we're depressed, become, because we're oppressed, because we're affluent, because we have more than what we need and more than what we know what to do with. We have closets full of clothing, some of which we haven't worn in the last three years. And we hang on to them because they're precious to us. And those things are standing in our way and the way of faith. If we have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor. He didn't say, give it to the preacher. Jesus didn't say, give it to me so that I have a, a place to lay my hand. He said, take your money and and give it to the poor. Help those in need. And then you will have faith. If you're not willing and able to do that. Where is your faith? It's in those times of desperation. That faith has ground and soil to work in. It's in situations like Israel. Where the people are on edge all of the time. 
It's in places like Africa where there is not enough food to eat. And the children are walking around with big bellies because the water they drink has protein in it. And that protein's alive and it's eating them from the inside out. There, there is faith in desperation. There's nothing else they can depend on. There's no doctors they can go to. There's no hospitals. And if there was a hospital, they wouldn't have enough coins to be able to get through the front door. God wants us to be movers of mountains. And movers of men. I recommend a book that's called The Mover of Mountains and the Mover of Men. It's probably not in print anymore, but I'm sure you can go to a bookstore and order it and get this tremendous book of a, a poor boy from a large family. Anyone know who I'm talking about? The man's name was Laterno. There's an attorney in Lethbridge by the name of Laterno. With nothing, he gave what he had to God. On the verge of bankruptcy, he assessed what his house was worth, what his horses were worth, what his wagons were worth, and he sold them so he gave God 10% of it. And then God started blessing him. In my mind, his greatest accomplishment was building a highway from the Texas border down through Mexico all the way down to the southern end of Argentina and receiving not one dollar for what he did. They didn't pave it. It was before the time of paving. He built the road berm like a highway that stretches and it is still used and sections of it are still, are still pa are being paved and more sections are being paved. But that road base, one man who moved mountains for God, has, he had one condition. It wasn't that they would send him some money. His one condition was wherever and whenever he set up a contract with every country that he went through, wherever and whenever there is a town that springs up, five acres of land will be set aside for an evangel evangelical congregation. And as more, as South America grows and towns are built along this highway, another five-acre site is given to an evangelical church, even to today. You need to read his story. He was a man who moved mountains in faith for God. He even did work in, in Israel and in Africa. God blessed him. He didn't bless him until he was willing to give himself totally to God. He would pray and ask God, what, 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 can I, what should I do? My wagons are stuck in the mud. And God would give him a practical solution. And he invented the, the caterpillar track. Okay. That was, he had other inventions before that. And many others after that. But he just gave himself in faith to God that God would give him answers for what needed to be done. God gives us answers and we sit on our, our duff or on the pew or on our chair. And we're too lazy to get up and do what God shows us. And then sometimes we're too selfish to share it with someone. If we can't do it, nobody needs to do it. You think I'm going to give my idea to some other joke so that he can profit by it? Yes! That's what God expects. 
give nothing, expecting nothing in return. And they reach Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. Coming to the end of the chapter. When they reached Capernaum, they went from t Mount Tavor back down the hills to the Sea of Galilee, all the way to the north side of the Sea of Galilee. It's a good place to be. The water's warm. It's good fishing there. Even after 3,000 3, years or 4,000 years of fishing, how does that little sea of Galilee, that lake, it is no bigger than an average lake in Canada. We think of the sea of Galilee, huge, monstrous place. You can see from one end to the other. You can walk around the whole thing in, in one day at a good, good clip. So we went back to Capernaum. The collectors of the temple tax came to Peter. We're back. Now we're back in the valley, right? We were up there with God, with Moses, with Elijah. We had the glory of God all around us. And now we're back in the valley, down below sea level, in this fishing village of Capernaum. And somebody comes, probably a Levite, like Matthew, a Levite, the tax collector, for the temple, temple tax collector Matthew, who wrote this. Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Did he need to? Absolutely not. <coughs> he was the son of the king. His father owns the universe. The children shouldn't have to pay the taxes. The foreigners should. But Yeshua set the example. Verse 27. However, so that we do not give offense to them. This is a verse a phrase that we need to learn so that we do not give offense and another part of in the scripture so that we do not take offense all of us give offense and there's none of you that are lily white that do not give offense I also give offense. And we take offenses without them even meaning to be offenses. We misunderstand the words of someone or the tone or the, uh, they didn't look in my eyes. Hasfa Halila, may that never happen. We give offenses and we take offenses. And those things need to stop in my life and in your lives. So he said to Peter, go down to the sea. Which sea? Tiberia. The sea of Galilee. The Canaries. Or the Kinnerets. Go. It was called the Sea of Galilee because it was in the region of Galilee, but the name of the lake was the Kinneret. Go down to the to the lake, to the sea, to the water. Take a fishing hook with you. Well, Peter could have thought, "I'm, I'm a fisherman. I use nets and a boat, and you want me to take a hook." Cast a hook into the lake. He's trying to tell me how to do my job. <laughs> and he's taking offense. We ever get that way? I'm a bricklayer. And someone who's never done brickwork before 
tell, instructs me on how to lay a brick straight. <laughs> or I was helping free of charge in Israel some Russian who had been cheated by a contractor and they were left with the shell of a house. I gave my time freely. Linda gave her time. Our daughter Dawn gave her time. We arranged for groups of people from around Israel to come and help build. We had a group from Finland come and build. A group from in England come and build. And we finished off five houses. And what the first one we did was of a believer. And the believer, because we were working free, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> and she was giving me instruction. My neighbor told me, you should have done it this way. Those cabinets that, those used cabinets that you got for me are going to fall from the ceiling. But because the work was free, you're inexperienced. When I finished her house and pretty much finished the other four, I had committed six months out of my life to doing this. And then I went as the, to a job at the American Embassy as the engineer superintendent with 100 men working under me and seven subcontractors, just to compare. As free labor, my yeah. work was worthless. And it was different when I was getting paid. <laughs> so, we take offense. Peter cast a hook, but Jesus, I use nets. Just to hook, Peter. And he says, when you, the first fish you get, you're going to pull in one fish. And I think he threw his, his hook in with a string. The fish was waiting, grabbed that hook, and he pulled it in. He didn't do too much fishing. Pulled it in. He says, you will find a coin. Take it out of its mouth and give it to those who need the temple tax. Even the little details of obligations in our life, Yeshua took care of them. What was he saying to us then? What time of year is this? It's time to pay your taxes. So, don't wait until after the deadline and then cry because you're paying a penalty. It's that time of year. Get your taxes done. And don't forget about the Lord. Remember, to give to, to God what belongs to God. And to Caesar. To President, or Prime Minister, I'm sorry. Prime Minister Harper, what is he's deserving, and the Premier of Alberta, what she's deserving. I can't remember her name. Ellison. And God will bless you. We need a personal experience with the living God. We need to be on that mountain. We need the power of God to descend and rest on us. Someone asked me the question. I'm diverting back to that. Did you speak in tongues then? When you were out of it for three hours in the presence of God? No. You missed a good chance. <laughs> Yes? About three weeks later, the Lord just anointed me with, again, and I spoke in tongues at 16. And it was a separate experience. 
Get all of what God has for you. And do all of what God wants you to do. Become, become mountain movers. Become life changers. Become miracle workers. All under the power of the Almighty God. And give back to Him the glory. Because it only comes from Him. Let Him use you. Step out of the boat. Take that mustard seed of faith and say to that mountain, Mountain, I command you, go over the other side of the, the valley. That's probably easier than some of the miracles that God does. In.